Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, John, it's your turn. What'd you pick? I picked a story uh, by Raymond Carver called Cathedral, a um, very famous story. Very good. Any kind of writing program you'd ever go into, they're going to recommend you read this. Or at least Except they used to. for Kent State. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But like I said, I'm pretty sure I've read this. It was extremely familiar. Is there a section that you want to read to us? Yes, near the middle. When we sat down at the table for dinner, we had another drink. My wife heaped Robert's plate with cube steak, scalloped potatoes, green beans. I buttered them up, two slices of bread. I said, here's bread and butter for you. I swallowed some of my drink. Now let us pray, I said. And the blind man lowered his head. My wife looked at me, her mouth agape. Pray the phone won't ring and the food doesn't get cold, I said. We dug in. We ate everything there was to eat on the table. We ate like there was no tomorrow. We didn't talk. We ate. We scarfed. We grazed that table. We were into serious eating. The blind man had right away located his foods. He knew just where everything was on his plate. I watched with admiration as he used his knife and fork on the meat. He'd cut two pieces of meat, fork the meat into his mouth, and then go all out for the scalloped potatoes, the beans next, and then he'd tear off a hunk of buttered bread and eat that. He'd follow this up with a big drink of milk. It didn't seem to bother him to use his fingers once in a while either. We finished everything, including half a strawberry pie. For a few moments, we sat as if stunned, sweat beaded on our faces. Finally, we got up from the table and left the dirty plates. We didn't look back. We took ourselves into the living room and sank into our places again. Robert and my wife sat on the sofa. I took the big chair. We had us two or three more drinks while they talked about the major things that had come to pass for them in the past 10 years. For the most part, I just listened. Now and then I joined in. I didn't want him to think I'd left the room, and I didn't want her to think I was feeling left out. They talked of things that had happened to them, to them, these past 10 years. I waited in vain to hear my name on my wife's sweet lips. And then my dear husband came into my life, something like that. But I heard nothing of the sort. More talk of Robert. Robert had done a little of everything, it seemed. A regular blind jack of all trades. But most recently, he and his wife had had an Amway distributorship, from which I gathered they'd earned their living, such as it was. The blind man was also a ham radio operator. He talked in his loud voice about conversations he'd had with fellow operators in Guam, in the Philippines, in Alaska, and even in Tahiti. He said he'd have lots of friends there if he ever wanted to go visit those places. From time to time, he'd turn his blind face toward me, put his hand under his beard, ask me something. How long had I been in my present position? Three years. Did I like my work? I didn't. Was I going to stay with it? What were the options? Finally, when I thought he was beginning to run down, I got up and turned on the TV. My wife looked at me with irritation. She was heading toward a boil. Then she looked at the blind man and said, Robert, do you have a TV? The blind man said, my dear, I have two TVs. I have a color set and a black and white thing, an old relic. It's funny, but if I turn the TV on, and I'm always turning it on, I turn on the color set. It's funny, don't you think? I didn't know what to say to that. I had absolutely nothing to say to that. No opinion. So I watched the news program and tried to listen to what the announcer was saying. This is a color TV, blind man said. Don't ask me how, but I can tell. We traded up a while ago, I said. The blind man had another taste of his drink. He lifted his beard, sniffed it, and let it fall. He leaned forward on the sofa. He positioned his ashtray on the coffee table, then put the lighter to his cigarette. He leaned back on the sofa and crossed his legs at the ankles. My wife covered her mouth, and then she yawned. She stretched. She said, I think I'll go upstairs and put on my robe. I think I'll change into something else. Robert, you make yourself comfortable, she said. I'm comfortable, the blind man said. I want you to feel comfortable in this house, she said. I am comfortable, the blind man said. So why did you pick this story? Well, originally, like two years ago, I picked a Raymond Carver story. I picked um, what we talk about when we talk about love. And um, that was because I was thinking about dialogue at the time. And that's a dialogue heavy story. But I had originally wanted to pick this one because this is the classic story. This is the one that, like I said, in every writing program you go to, you're going to be shoved this story. Because this is kind of like just a paradigm example in some ways, a paradigm example of what a short story is and what it can be and what it does, what the form does. So I thought it would be useful to talk about And because it's so famous and so well-read and I'm sure, you know, everyone will have read it or is going to read it. Or will attend a creative writing program that requires it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know how many packets I got when I was in college that were like, here's Cathedral again. (laughs) Yeah. Well, um, like I said, it was very familiar when I read it again, but I couldn't tell you 
when or why I read it. And it still felt like really new to me. So who knows if I actually read it. But um, what do you like about it aside from all that? Because I remember the last Raymond Carver story that we did. And we talk about that one all the time, either on this podcast or like in our workshop, both as you mentioned, as an example of dialogue, but just uh, how dialogue can also be basically an entire story if you're doing it right. What I love about this story is the ending and how the whole story builds that just absolutely amazing ending. This is like what a short story should do it should just leave you in this transported state when you get to the end of it right it's affecting it's simple right it's yeah. so simple and yet so emotional it's such a well-crafted journey to get to that moment that's the i mean that's the thing that i like about this story and i think that's the reason that it's so famous it's just it's an easy story to kind of look at and say this is what fiction can do yeah these are the things that fiction does yeah when you when you mentioned that what i thought of was what i was kind of impressed by the second time I read it in preparation for this podcast, which is that here's a character that has one of the most dramatic changes in such a short space. And it's almost it's almost abrupt. He's for two thirds of the story, just like a total jerk. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he's like really unlikable, but he's also not interested in being likable. He's not even like necessarily trying to endear himself to the reader at any point. Uh, he's just kind of telling it like it is. And it's almost when he starts getting high. <laughs> and I had yeah. to remind myself that like he's under the influence, like he's been drinking and he's all been night. smoking all night. And you kind of forget that because you're not in the room, you're not watching him shift or his eyes glaze over so you have to kind of remind yourself of that as the reader because he he doesn't even indicate that he's feeling any differently because of it you know he's not saying to himself i was loose now i i felt weird or i was comfortable like it's it's really subtle he's not attributing anything to the effects of these substances but you kind of remind yourself of that you're like you know that was probably like the social lubrication for this whole scenario right that he might find himself on the floor drawing with the blind man yeah but it's like such a massive shift. He goes from not wanting to entertain this man in his home because he's blind, not wanting to entertain him because he feels weird about his wife having had some kind of intimate relationship with him where she shared all these things with him. And he just like doesn't want to talk to this guy in particular or in the abstract. And then he starts to just kind of feel comfortable in his presence. And he's it's just it's such a subtle shift, but it's huge because by the end, you like him. He's had this transformation formative, almost religious experience. I don't know. You're, you're right. It's like, it, that's why I feel like this is the embodiment of what a short story can do. You can have this kind of like character arc in a novel and you would expect it, but this is over the course of an evening. That's like yeah. the power of short fiction. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's not big. It's not this um, vast epic thing. It's just this guy's coming to the house and we're going to have dinner and we're going to sit in front of the TV and chat and uh, try to make small talk and kind of fail half the time. Right. And then somehow come to this moment at the end. Yeah. It's, it's domestic, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. The premise is pretty, uh, you know, something that you can be familiar with or you can, you can get your head around this premise as the average reader. You don't have to have come up with something like bizarre. Absolutely. Yeah. And from something so just grounded and ordinary, it's like you said, it's almost a religious experience. It's like reaching yeah. for this larger thing, you know, vaster, you know, they draw a cathedral. So there's definitely some religious in that, but yeah. Well, and there's that moment where I think it's after he starts to describe the cathedral, or maybe it's just while they're watching the documentary about it, that the blind man asks the narrator, are you religious? And he's like, no, I don't believe in anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's even like, I don't know that, that, don't, that conversation almost most serves not to like give you religious undertones, but to like tell you about this narrator in general. Like he's, he seems like a very negative guy and it's probably because there's nothing in his life that he's thrilled about. And it's, you know, he says he's not thrilled about work. He seems like miffed at his wife for 10 different reasons. And he certainly put off this night. And then, you know, it's like, well, on a personal level, do you believe in anything? He's like, no, <laughs> 
He seems yeah. untethered. I thought you were going to use that as a launch pad for like the kind of hinting at where we were going because there's a, when they turn the TV on and he's like, um, he, uh, by the way, these guys don't have names, right? It's just the first person character. And then Robert is the Robert, blind man. Okay. I was going to say, I think the blind man has a name. Okay. Yeah. But the two, the man and his wife don't have a name. Okay. Robert has a name, which we could talk about how that's introduced later. But so the narrator asks him, you know, do you care what we watch? And he's like, bub, it's all right. The blind man said, it's fine with me. Whatever you want to watch is okay. And by the way, the way he writes this dialogue where they say the same thing three times in a row, each time they say anything uh, is uh-huh. brilliant. I love the way that's that's written. Bob, it's all right. It's fine with me. Whatever you want to watch is okay. And then he says, I'm always learning something. Learning never ends. It won't hurt me to learn something tonight. I got ears, he said. You know, in the moment, you're just like, okay, that's just what they're saying. But knowing where it ends, you, you might look at that as like, oh, that's kind of a, a hint at where this might go. Yeah. I mean, I had no clue where it was going to go. And it's it was almost like not until the second read that you realize that a shift is taking place. You realize that he's like, he. you don't attribute any of the shift to some like personal revelation so much much as, all right, you know, this is a weird, interesting dude. And now I, my curiosity is peaked, at least for this evening. I can probably get through this evening because there's enough here for me to be interested in. It doesn't seem like he's coming around. It doesn't seem like he's warming up to him even. It's just kind of like he's singing to himself, I got to get through tonight. And, uh, oh, this guy wants to smoke with me. Like, all right, we'll be good. You know? That's right. And at first he's like, I wish my wife wouldn't go to sleep. I wish she wouldn't nod off right now. I wish she'd come back downstairs. But as soon as like they have that one thing that they can kind of bond over. And then as soon as like Robert says kind of the line that you just said, where he's he's like, listen, I'm just here to chill with you. You can turn the TV on. The guy kind of like gets comfortable, almost like against his better judgment. And he's like, well, this is what I have to do tonight. So I'll embrace it. It's like you only think the shift is going to pertain to like how he has to get through the evening. That's all I saw coming. And then it's like not until the second read that you realize it's all kind of leading to something much bigger than that for him personally. Yeah. Yeah, there's a discomfort to it. You know, um, Robert tells him, they, they keep asking Robert, do you want to go up to your bedroom? Are you tired? Do you want to go to bed? And he's like, no, no, I'll stick around here. It's like they're making the same effort um, on either side to neither. Because Robert starts nodding off. He's kind of yeah, 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 not really awake, not really into it until till the end, you know, the ending of the story. But they're both just this is what we got to do. Got to somehow find a way to, you know, because the wife brought them both together. She fell asleep, you know, like. <laughs> I don't want to retreat from this. Yeah. He does a really good job, Raymond Carver, of capturing this exact scenario that we've all had where you have a guest, not just for the evening, but overnight, and you have different bedtimes. And it's like, do you want to sleep with your door closed or open? Do you need a nightlight? Here's the bathroom. <laughs> like all these like weird things that uh, you're really anxious about all of a sudden because you you know how important they are for you. They're like both bending over backwards to be like, no, we're totally fine. This is totally cool. This is exactly what I'd be doing otherwise. And uh, yeah, maybe the narrator kind of senses is that even Robert is not completely at ease. I think the narrator thought that Robert was going to bust the door down, make himself comfortable because he knows his wife so well and just like be this major like imposition. But he realizes almost like I said, against his better judgment, why this guy is interesting and great and why his wife would confide in him. I mentioned before how nobody has a name except Robert, but he's just called the blind man. You know, the first line is this blind man and a blind man in my house is not something I look forward to. So he's just the blind man. But the way his name is introduced here is uh, talking about how Robert's wife died and he was sitting there with her when she died, holding her hand. And he's like, and then to slip off into death, the blind man's hand on her hand, his blind eyes streaming tears. I'm imagining now her last thought may be this. That he never even knew what she looked like. And she on an express to the grave. Robert was left with a small insurance policy and half a 20 peso Mexican coin. The other half of the coin went into the box with her. Pathetic. That's the first time we get his name. It's introduced as if we already know it, you know? Yeah, I don't don't remember uh, being introduced to it, but... It's just so naturally done. Yeah. I don't know how he labored over that, how he figured out this was where to do it and this is how to do it. Because using he, the pronoun, or just saying the blind man again, probably would have been fine. But at that moment, it just slips in and that's it. Now we know his name is Robert. And it kind of mimics the way the narrator's thought processes are probably going. You know, that's probably why he did it. 
it. If you really think about it, he's imagining the situation. So he's getting closer to Robert in that moment, in his thoughts at least. So he's giving him a name instead of just calling him the blind man. Something like that. Well, also like the next section is when the blind man literally shows up. So the yeah. next time Robert is used is when it says, my wife said, I want you to meet Robert. Yes. Yeah. But it's interesting that he introduced us to Robert before the husband, yes, you know, yes. by name. Yeah. Yeah. I marked that as just, I think this is, you know, Carver's a, an amazing, he's an excellent writer. He obviously worked really hard at his craft and knows how to make fiction sing. And he picked that moment. It was uh, an interesting thing. You know, if we dig into it, you probably learn something from that. Right. And I also think that an amateur couldn't get away with it. <laughs> in yeah. like a workshop you know i think we'd all oh, be we saying can spend half an hour on that we'd be like yeah. why is his name not in here until page i four? was so confused i think you should tell us earlier like we say that kind of stuff all the time so you know i don't want to give raymond too much credit here because maybe he didn't think of it either but yeah i think you're right like someone like that has probably made a, a conscious choice maybe not in advance but upon final edit i remember i wrote a novel and um i wasn't shying away from curse words but i I, um, I didn't use the F word until a specific moment in the book. Right. I wanted the F word to come out of a particular character at a particular moment before it's ever, ever uttered. That would be the first place in the whole book where it would show up just for that impact it would have. And that's, right. that's an easy word to work with, right? <laughs> yeah. It's an adjective, a noun, a verb. Yeah. It's not something that you have to use in other places. So I, I, whereas somebody's name is, is something that's more sure, difficult sure, sure. to okay. put off. Right. But I think, you know, as writers, we do that we think about the whole idea of use a, a 50 cent word you don't want to use it three times in a page so you right. spread it out but which moment do you actually employ it right or deploy it deploy it deploy the <laughs> f-bomb yeah so okay fine we can believe that raymond did this intentionally for tons of deft reasons <laughs> Yeah, so much like what we talk about when we talk about love, this is dialogue heavy. It's also benefiting from three people talking at once, which is as powerful as four when we're talking about like authentic dialogue and the misunderstanding and like the misdirection and the crosstalk and even examples like the one you read where people are kind of repeating their sentiments, you know, like, yeah, that's fine. That's yeah. totally okay. Even in the narration, he does that. He said, uh, yeah. in where I read it, I didn't know what to say to that. I had absolutely nothing to say to that. No opinion. Three sentences that say the same thing. Yeah. He says it all everywhere. It might be just a uh, quirk of the character, but yeah, to me, that felt like a quirk of the character, but also. So, I mean, you're writing the character's thoughts, so you're yeah. aware of what you're doing. But I, I liked that section because I, I felt like saying I have nothing to say about that is saying something about that. That's right. You know, he's like, <laughs> I had nothing to say to that. People say that all the time. They're like, I had nothing. Oh, I have nothing to say about that. It's like, yeah, you're, you have nothing to say out loud about that. But uh, we're reading between the lines and you don't approve or you think it's dumb, you know. And so later on, the blind man, he does the same thing. Robert does the same thing. He says, Robert asks him to describe what a cathedral looks like. And he kind of doesn't do a good job. Yeah. And he, he finally says, it looks like that's the best I can do for you. I'm just no good at it. That's all right, bub. The blind man said, hey, listen, I hope you don't mind me asking you. Can I ask you something? Let me ask you a simple question. Yes or no. I'm just curious and there's no offense. You're my host, but let me ask if you are in any way religious. You yeah. don't mind me asking. Like there's one question buried in that paragraph that's like on this pagination is like six lines long. Right. But he has to say, I want to ask you a question like six times. Yeah. And it, that's like really authentic, right? That's how we yeah. all ask questions that we're uncomfortable asking. Yes. We talk about this in the workshop a lot where that's authentic dialogue. Authentic dialogue is not these perfectly polished sentences where people, you know, not only say what they mean, but uh, say it precisely or poetically or succinctly. These characters are really good representations. I mean, if you, if you wrote down a transcript of our podcast, I have so many false starts and likes and ums, you know. No, if you wrote down a transcript of the podcast before I edited it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that might be helpful. But uh, 
it's almost refreshing to read that though on the page. Maybe in real life, you don't want to hear an unedited version of our podcast, but when you're talking to someone, you recognize that as real dialogue. And when, if you saw it on the page, you'd recognize it as real dialogue. You can tell the difference between polished dialogue. Yeah. Also, I'm pretty sure I've said this before, but I say it all in like personal time. I absolutely hate when I'm watching a movie and I can predict the next line of dialogue. It happens all the time. You can literally predict word for word sometimes. And And that is corny on the one hand, but also it's a writerly thing to think. And then the character would say this instead of, and this is how humans respond to each other. You know what I mean? You're almost like putting on your, your writer hat when you write some of this stuff and it comes off too writerly. Yeah. We've talked to before on the podcast about going out and listening to people talk, just (laughs) eavesdropping a conversation. Yeah. Uh It's such a good exercise just to, because when you're, when you're engaged in a conversation, you don't notice all those things. You have to give yourself a little remove so you can pay attention to all the little false starts and second guesses. Yeah. Like uh, it's especially good. I think to listen to like strangers who are strangers to each other, talk to each other, you know? Oh yeah. Like if you know, it's a first date or if it's like, even at the grocery store, like uh, the customer talking to the cashier and you're just like wincing the whole time. You're like, oh, (laughs) this is, it could stop all the ways that we like kind of put on for each other. What else can we say about this story? We had a conversation recently in the workshop about like the main crux of your story. If you're thinking about problems with it or solutions for it or how you want to change it is like, what emotional reaction do you want the reader to have? And this is one of those ones where he absolutely nailed it. Like it feels like this complete rising action, major climax at the end. And you read all 14 pages, however long it is, and you don't know where it's going but you're along for the ride and you don't necessarily sense the shifts. But when it happens, it's like a wallop. It's like, like I cried the second time reading it because I was like, oh my God, like it's it's incredible. You, c- you can't even hope to accomplish anything as memorable as this necessarily, but you can achieve that emotional buildup. You can achieve like the rising, rising, rising action, kind of the winding path and still like hit your reader over the head and kind of take them by surprise, you know? That's why I kind of called this the paradigm case for yeah. the short story. And I think that's why it's put into all these anthologies and thrust upon MFA students and BFA students and any kind of creative writing student you might meet is because it's like, this is what you can do. This is the thing you can accomplish if you work at it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. This should be like, you read it once a year to remind yourself why you work so hard at this craft in particular. And it's because this is what, this is the best of what you can hope to achieve with it. That's right. You get that moment at the end where I don't know how, I mean, I knew it was going to happen. Like I've read this a couple of times. I read it 25 years ago. I read it uh, maybe 10 years ago. Right. I knew all the turns. I knew exactly how it was going to play out when I read it in preparation for the podcast. Right. And yeah, when I got to the ending there, it was still that rush and you just feel it. And it's just amazing. Like how, how in the world do you accomplish that? And I, I want to do that in every story I write. Yeah. I want to be able to do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you want to at least be able to accomplish whatever emotional response for your reader that you've set out to do, you know, like yeah. you might not be able to, to do something this big, but you want to nail it in a way that's like, it's unmistakable what you wanted them to take away. And for them to be impressed that you were able to do it, like elicit that from them. When I was looking up like criticism on this, I came across a, a link to like a very poorly made short film about it. <laughs> and I couldn't couldn't bring myself to watch it, but uh, I like scrubbed through and I was like, there's no way, there's no way you can accomplish what this made me feel in movie format. There's, I mean, there's so many films like that. So many films like that, that are based on books that, you know, maybe you watch it and you cry, like you cried when you read the book, but they're not accomplishing the same thing that happens in your head when you read it. No, there's an intimacy that's lost when you go from prose to film because film is even when they try to do camera tricks and call they call it first person or point of view camera it's still it's inherently third person because you're never inside someone's skull you get if you do narration you can but that it's clunky as a device if you have like you know voiceover kind of narration it's like these are my thoughts i'm going to speak them to you but it's not the same as reading the words and being inside the head of character the way you are when you read them on a page because and that you can crush that psychic distance down to nothing 
and you are in their right. head and seeing through their eyes and feeling their feelings and seeing what they see. You cannot do that in film. And I think we're, we are in this guy. We are, we are, we become this guy in a certain sense as mm-hmm. we're reading this and we feel with him that moment at the end. And that's the power you get from fiction writing that you can't get in film. Film can do other things. There's a lot of good stuff film can do, but that's what you can right. do with fiction. And that's what's lost when people try to mimic what is great fiction. Like I wish Hollywood would stop trying to mimic good storytelling and just just mimic plot. Like if you want to make Dune a movie, fine, whatever. Like I get why you want to make Dune a movie, yeah. but don't try to do something like there. this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like you can see it and you want to see it, like especially if it's visual, blah, blah, blah. But if it's like a big epic story with twists and turns, I get it. But yeah. then there's like some stuff that's like quiet, like short stories, and you're like, please don't fucking touch it. It's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else that we should say about this before we talk about a takeaway? Uh no. <laughs> okay. Do you have a takeaway? My takeaway is just basically everything I've been saying this whole time is um this story is the paradigm case for certain kind of short story curtain potential that short stories have. There are other things short stories can do, and there are other forms and other things we can do, but for a certain thing, this is this hits everything. Yeah. So I think studying this story and the way it reaches its effect, the way that backstory is kind of layered in the front, how it's unspooled, how we then get to this really clear, well-described scene where we get to see the characters in action and how it builds to that ending, that emotional ending that kind of surprises you. It's yes. a surprising and inevitable thing, right? It surprises you, but it feels like this is the only place it could have gone. So just dissecting a story in that way as a way to guide our own writing. I think that's what I would get out of this story as a takeaway. Yeah. The only other thing I think I would add, if you want to try to achieve something that, you know, we've said, this is the example of what this form can do, but also if you want to mimic how this form achieved it, it's with, you know, a single scene, a single evening, Mm -hmm. and it's a character that's having a major, major shift. And like one of the easiest ways to make that shift appear major is to start with him being something like unlikable, you know, that's like, that's a very simple premise that we can all go and start like write an unlikable first person narrator and then have that person experience something in the course of several hours. I think a lot of times when we think that we want to achieve this like wallop of an emotional impact, we think to ourselves that we have to earn it and we have to earn it by being clever and we have to have it drawn out. We have to think big. And there's got to be a lot going on, but that's short story like forces you to abandon that premise. You have to do it quickly. You have to do it tighter and you have to probably cover less time and be less grandiose, but you can still pack the emotional wallet. You can probably do it better. So I think you have to think small. (laughs) I'm thinking of all these stories that we've covered on the podcast that were a single, more or less a single scene, like A&P, wherever you go, where are you going? going wherever you've been at Joyce Carol Oates was a single scene. Even that story we did, Curtis Sittenfeld's story, um, The Prairie Wife. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a single day. It was a couple of scenes within a day, but it had that single day kind of thing. Yeah. It's all these stories are, they have lots of backstory. It reaches for backstory, but the action, the emotional journey is all in this single moment. Yeah. And I think that's achievable even for a new writer. And even like the, the emotional shift doesn't have to be major either. No. It could just be someone like understanding someone for the first time or apologizing or conceding to a point of view or I don't know, like just being nice. It's like the Grinch, you know, everybody loves the Grinch because he goes from total asshole to (laughs) nice softy. Yeah. I think that makes it more obvious what the shift is when you start with someone that's just unlikable. Yeah. I heard there's an author that I like who uh, talks about, he writes stories for characters who need them. They need the thing that happens to fit, to like help them. They're in such a place that they need the story so they can come out the other end better. Wow. That's a really good way to think of it. And I keep thinking when I talk about this narrator being unlikable, I keep thinking of like the first story that I chose for the podcast, which is like a New Yorker piece. I think it was like the second or third episode that we did is tc boyle's the lie yeah so the the narrator is like well i wanted to call off work so i said my kid was sick god 
And then I told everyone that my kid died. And then I started, they collected money for the funeral. And then I kept the money. And then my wife found out. And like the whole time, you want to kill this guy. And a really good way to think of it is he needed that to happen. That was rock bottom for him. And I don't really remember the revelations so much. I I know his wife leaves. But uh, yeah, we're, we're meeting that character in his worst hour. That's right. Not a good moment for him. No. Very good. Well, thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.